Hey, this is Elizabeth Potts Weinstein, and today we're going to look at whether or not you can use chat GPT or other AI to create legal documents and do legal research. So for those of you who don't know, probably you do if you clicked on this video, but um, chat GPT is one of the AI, the AI, and I'm putting quote marks around that, that exists for you to use to create things. And there are different versions of AI out there. There, some of them are for making photos or art, art like Dali, but then there's other ones that are used for text generation. And people have been using these to write blog posts, to write essays that they turn in at school, which is a violation of ethical rules at their school, but you know, people do that, to help them in to create all kinds of things in their business. And one of the things that's going on is there's this idea that you could use ChatGPT, for example, to create anything that's text instead of paying for someone to do it. So not just writing a blog post, even though you could pay someone to write your blog post for you, but could you use it to do legal research, to generate contracts for you, documents that you file in court, all that kind of stuff. So here's the thing. I think there's a big misnomer among many people about what AI is. We think of AI being artificial intelligence, that it actually is intelligent. But the truth is that all our AI is, is recognizing and generating things according to patterns. So the algorithm is not creating the documents. The, what the algorithm it does is it is a structure for this program to learn by being exposed to a gazillion tons of data. And in some cases, AI can be absolutely brilliant. So for example, AI is better than human beings at identifying whether or not someone has lung cancer based on x-rays, because that is pure pattern recognition. AI is actually better than expert people who do this for a living, because it's just great. Computers are great at recognizing patterns, but that doesn't mean that a computer is good at giving legal advice because legal advice, at least as of right now, isn't just pattern recognition and producing someone about something based on those patterns. It is more than that. And there may be a day where a computer can give you great legal advice about something. But here's the reason that it's a problem right now is that ChatGPT is made to give you something that seems correct, not something that is correct. Something that sounds right, sounds plausible, not something that is right. So how does this actually work in reality? If you ask ChatGPT a question, what it does is it gives you an answer that sounds like a lawyer could have written it. It sounds like it could have been written in a blog post or be the text of some video. But that doesn't mean that it is legally accurate. It just sounds good. These AIs are great at BSing. They're not great at actually being correct. So let me give you some examples of how this actually works. And I'm going to start with things that I are actual facts. Um, and these are things about me, myself, because I know facts about myself. And then we're going to move on to let's play around with how this could work for legal research and for generating legal documents. I actually think there are some cases where this can be very helpful in the legal world, but maybe not how you think. So let's go into ChatGPT and I have it open here and I've asked it some questions over the last couple of months. So one of the questions actually is about myself because obviously I can verify whether or not certain facts are true. What does Elizabeth Potts Weinstein do? Now, I'm the only Elizabeth Potts Weinstein that I know of. There are other Elizabeth Potts and other Elizabeth Weinsteins, but not other Elizabeth, po Elizabeth Potts Weinsteins, at least that I know of. So Elizabeth Potts Weinstein is a lawyer author and entrepreneur. She's known for her work as a legal advisor and business strategist, which I don't know if that's exactly true, but maybe you could say that. And then it says, I have authored several books, including The Wealth Spa, A Sensible Approach to Financial Independence, and How to Successfully Escape the Nine to Five Grind and Create the Life You Deserve. Those sound like real books. They sound like I could have maybe written them, but I can tell you right now that I did not write those books and nobody's written those books. They don't exist. Let's actually put this into Google 
Has anyone actually written this book? No results found. Now, if you don't put quote marks around it, there's other people who have written similar things, right? About being financially independent, retiring early, et cetera. I actually had a blog that was called The Wealth Spa, I don't know, 15 years ago, a really long time ago. So it took information that exists and smashed it all together to create something that is plausible, but not true. I asked it other questions like, what is my YouTube channel about? And it said the right things that it is about legal stuff, right? Totally the right answer that it's about legal and business topics. But then it gave the, the some names of allegedly popular videos, including how to trademark your business name, five legal tips for starting your online business, and how to create an LLC for your online business. Now, those are actually pretty good titles for videos. And it gave me some ideas for videos. I missed a great five legal tips for starting your online business. That's a great topic. I have no videos that are called like this. And this is one of the things that's really weird to me about chat GPT is that these AIs, they're not even doing a Google search. They're actually just, they're not, they're not checking the accuracy of things. They are generating results that sound right, that could be right in some alternative reality. Now it even gets weirder because I asked if I was ever a financial planner, which I actually was a financial planner. And then it went into this thing that I actually am currently a financial planner. I'm the co-founder of a EPW wealth management that I run with my husband. I don't have a husband. So I definitely am not running this business with my husband or any other business with my husband because I don't have one. And EPW wealth management, I'm actually going to Google that right now to make, see if it is a thing that exists. There's an EP wealth advisors that exists. It actually looks like a fairly large place. There's an EPW Investment Management Incorporated, but I have not started a business with EPW in it for financial planning. And I don't do that now. It says that I'm a licensed financial planner. So by the way, there's no such thing as a licensed financial planner. You can be a, a registered investment advisor. You can be a certified financial planner. There isn't a licensed financial planner. That's not like a thing that exists. So that wouldn't really be correct anyway. I asked it then, am I married? And it said that I'm married to someone named Andrew Weinstein. I don't know anybody named Andrew Weinstein. And that we're the co that person is a co-founder with me and that I have children, which I do have a one child who is 18, is, is an adult, but um, I don't have children in the plural. So anyway, this is just an example of how these AI services will give you information that sounds very good, but it's not necessarily accurate. So let's go in and ask it about other things, okay? About legal things that you may want to do and see what it does, especially compared to like a Google search. All right, so let's say you wanna know, should I be a sole proprietorship or an LLC? Should my, let's say, life coaching business be an LLC or a sole proprietorship? Ah, so they actually have it that you're not, they're not, it's not qualified to provide legal advice. And then it's going to give us some information about this. It's thinking, okay, I can't give you legal advice. Good, because you're actually true. As a sole proprietor, you're the sole owner. You're personally liable. It's simpler and less expensive. True. For me, LLC is layer protection. In most cases, it's only risk, some tax benefits. An LLC does not offer tax benefits. That's actually not true. If you have an LLC that is taxed as an S corp, then you get tax benefits. A plain old LLC isn't going to really have tax benefits. Um, more flexibility when it comes to management and ownership, sort of. Um, decisions individual, and you have to consult. So this is what I'm talking about. Now, it it, it is actually say, saying it is not a lawyer, right? So let's go ahead and put this into Google and see what it says. So you're gonna get blog posts. Should I start an LLC for my life coaching business? Incorporating your coaching business, how to set up a business, do co life coaches need it? Um, if you look at the video one, you're gonna have things that are actually, some of them are from lawyers. I don't think I've done a video on that specifically. Um, so here's one that actually is specifically, should I start an LLC for my life coaching business? I haven't reviewed so for legal research questions, it's not going to really be able to give you any, any better answer than some random blog post. So let's ask it a question that is that should have an answer. 
Um, does, oops, let's, here we go. Does a business in Los Angeles need a business license from the city? Yes. Businesses operating with city limits need a business license. It depends on the type of its location. So this actually gave a correct answer, in my opinion. That sounds good. Now, one of the things that I think is very important to see is it doesn't cite anything. I have no idea where it gets these answers from. And so you, how do you know if it's true? It's not even giving you a link to where to go. I mean, you could probably ask it for that link. Let's see. Um, give me, me a link to City of LA Business License Information. Let's see if it can do that. Yeah, there you go. If you click on that, it opens it up. Oh, no, it doesn't. It says page not found. <laughs> ah, that link doesn't work. Okay. That's lovely. I'll have to tell you. All right. Now let's see if, and this is what I'm saying is, I think for these types of questions, you're probably better off just putting it into Google. So um, city of LA business license information. If I put that into Google, I get this. Let's see if I click on it. Oh, look, it's actually the right thing. And I click on this. These links all work. So you're better off using Google for a lot of stuff. All right. Now let's see if we can get it to generate documents. So this is something that I think might be a place where this could be helpful. So let's say you want to send a cease and desist letter. Say someone's infringing your trademark. And you want to send a cease and desist letter, but you and you want it to sound like legal, but you don't want to pay a lawyer to do it because you don't have the money for it, whatever. So you're you need to come up with something that sounds very legal. Now you're not gonna like sign some other lawyer's name. It's still just gonna be from you because you're the one sending it, but you want it to sound good. So let's see if we can figure out how to get it to write. Write a cease and desist letter for someone to stop infringing a trademark. My trademark my trademark. Okay. All right. This is a really good place to start. Uh, and this is one of the places that I think is very interesting, is generating stuff that sounds legally good. Now, I am going to give you some information about this, about the risks you have with sending letters like this. But so obviously, it's, you're going to have your name and date and fringing party and blah, blah, blah. I'm writing you regarding your unauthorized use of my trademark, blah, 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 which I have registered with the trademark office under registration number. And then you have that. I've really soon become aware that you use my trademark connection with business activities. Your use is likely to cause confusion. It may dilute the distinctness of my mark. That, that, these are great language things. Now I actually would in here would always say what the person did. So I would like link to you're, you're selling this product and I've linked to where they sell the product, you know, your use of it on this page. You know, I would give real specific examples because I want to tell them to do something. Your authorized use is trademark infringement, violation of federal and state law, meaning cease and desist from using my trademark in any way. I actually will, will tell them exactly what to do. So I'll say, I want you to stop selling this product with this thing on it. You have to stop using this thing. You have to take down, take it off of your website. You have to take this logo down. Like I tell them really specifically what I want them to do because then they can do it. It's possible. Be able to comply. I'll take all necessary legal action. Please be advised, may result in significant costs and expenses. Now, one of the things is, is when you say this, when you actually send a letter, cease and desist letter that is fairly threatening in this way, then they have the ability to file a lawsuit against you for declaratory relief. So it's saying that they don't infringe. So it's just something to be aware of that if you send this to a larger business, they could theoretically sue you to show that they don't infringe you. So just something to know you're kind of being hardcore. Uh, I request you respond to this letter within X number of days. Very, very good thing. Confirming you've ceased to use. If I don't respond, then I will have no choice to pursue legal action against you. I usually don't say legal action. I usually say, I say something a little bit softer <laughs> than legal action. Thank you for your attention. I've been solved amicably. I not need a further action. So this is a fairly hardcore legal letter. And I'm not necessarily saying that this is exactly what you should send because 
there are times where actually it makes sense to send something a bit softer that's a bit more open to negotiation because this does give them the ability to file a declaratory relief action, most likely. However, it is a place to start. It is a place to start. All right, let's see if we can get it to write something else. Write a, a software consulting contract. Let's just like write a software consulting contract. Let's just see what it does. Mm, okay. So this so far actually looks halfway decent. Okay. Confidentiality, ownership of IP, term termination, governing law. So really what this is doing is it's creating a template. If you, one thing to remember is it isn't doing this according to the law of any particular state. This is like a generic template. Now, one thing I think this could be really helpful for you is to give you an idea of what these things are supposed to look like. So uh, let's go up to the beginning. Um, this kind of looks letterish by having these things, but that's totally fine. The software consulting contract made between day between this company and that company. Um, the, you have some kind of background that talks about what we're talking about here. Typically, you're going to have a scope exhibit A. It will talk about what the details are of the project, what the deliverables are, what the compensation is going to be. Uh, fees are non-refundable and payable in such and such terms, the date of the invoice, you charge interest. This is a very short confidentiality clause, so if you may need a more extensive NDA. Ownership of IP, so all IP created by consultant will be owned by a client. You may actually not want that. So it's something to address. Also, IP in the case of software, you may need to go to a lot more detail with getting into what about things that are patentable, etc. Term and termination, commence effective date, we'll keep going until terminated, governing law, laws of state of blah, 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 in the county, it's independent contractor, this is the entire agreement. Okay, so whether or not certain things are enforceable in any particular state or whether or not this complies with the laws of any particular state is not addressed here. So for example, in some states, when you have an independent contractor agreement, it actually has to go into details about to justify the fact that this is a con independent contractor. So it needs to go into the fact that the contractor can work wherever they want, that you're not control the manner and means of the which of how they're doing the services, that they can work the hours that they want. It, you know, things that show that they're a contractor and not an employee. So this doesn't go into those kind of details. And th that's the idea of this. This is like a a place to start, but it really doesn't go into enough details anywhere. But it's actually kind of interesting. Let's do one more. Um, create an LLC operating agreement for two members for a, a Californ California LLC with two members. Let's just see what it does there. I wonder where it's coming up with this stuff. I mean, it is interesting to me in that way. And the one thing that I'm getting from both, from all these contracts and things is these are very, 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 very simple agreements. And generally, even I, like I actually try to have my contracts that I draft be very simple and straightforward. This is really simple, okay? So for example, all right, it, it's created the formation and purpose of the company. That's, that's normal stuff, name and principal place of business. The term is perpetual, capital contributions, that's fine. I usually should put the chart right in here, but that's fine, we can schedule. So this doesn't say anything about taxes. So typically with the LLC operating agreement, or a partnership agreement for that matter, I would say something about how the business is going to be taxed. I would say something about distributions to pay taxes, stuff like that. The profit and loss will be allocated according to the interest. Oh, it's implying that the interest percentages are in Schedule A. Got it. Uh, but it doesn't say what the tax status is, I don't think. 
The man man members will manage it, and then the manner it can delegate managers. So typically in the contracts I cr in the operating agreements that I create, I actually go into more detail in what the how the management structure will work. So for example, if you have two members, the default is that either of them can do anything on behalf of the LLC. And that may not be what you want. You may want it that certain day-to-day -day things for the LLC can be done by either member, but there are certain things they have to have unanimous agreement on, like getting a big loan or signing a lease or you know, stuff that over anything over a certain amount of money. So you may want something more complicated that goes into things in more detail. They're gonna have meetings, they can have the meetings in person by telephone, video conference, or by written consent. That's very normal. You have to keep books. So dissolution and termination. I go usually go into much more detail. And one of the things that can happen with a business that's owned by two people is what if one of them is disabled, it dies, wants to leave the business, becomes a terrible person, who knows, right? How, what's going to happen? This doesn't address that at all. I mean, one of the wonderful things you can do in a partnership agreement, in an LLC operating agreement, is address, or shareholder agreement for a corporation, is address what happens if things break down. Because this business is probably not going to last forever. There's going to be some point where one or both people want to leave because they want to retire, because they want to sell the business, because they want to do something else, because they're dead. And so what happens then? This doesn't address that at all. All right, governing law, state of California, which makes sense because it's where it is. And it can be amended only by written agreement of the members. Okay, so this is, this is what I'm talking about. These are good basic, 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 basic frameworks. But... I wouldn't use this because you actually will almost always want something a little bit more complicated. I mean, this is incredibly overly simple. So I think the only thing I would actually use this for, to be honest, the only thing I really use this for is generating ideas. So if you want to think of blog posts to write, videos to make, what kind of stuff goes in a contract, I mean, all kinds of things of brainstorming and getting ideas Using this just like you would use Google to get some more research and more information and ideas is a great thing. Even looking at the stuff it produced about me gave me ideas for videos that I could do in the future. And I think that's where we are with the chat GPT and the other AIs is they're good for idea generation, but not really to give you accurate answers. Again, this is attorney Elizabeth Potts Weinstein. If you have any questions about what we talked about today, feel free to post them in the comments below and I'll try to point you in the right direction. Thumbs up if you found this video helpful. Subscribe for more videos like this. And if you'd like to continue the conversation, you can join the Discord for free or you can sign up as a member of the Patreon. Links for all that are below. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye-bye.